The rights of every man are diminished when the rights of one are threatened. Very good evening. This is The Role of Law and today's episode will focus on a discussion surrounding the report of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, of the United Nations on Sri Lanka. This report has been termed as a damning report in, on Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka has rejected the content of this report, stating that there is a lack of substance in the report. To discuss these matters, we've got with us here an expert, of course, on these matters, a person who has worked inside the United Nations in various capacities. She is none other than Tamara Kunanayagam, former Sri Lankan permanent representative to the United Nations, who also spent 10 years at the office of the, human, of the High Commissioner for Human Rights of the United Nations. She has spent 15 years in total at the United Nations and also four years as the chair of the Working Committee on the Human Rights Council on the Right to Development. A very good evening, madam, and welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Good evening, Shadow. Um, madam, of course, given your years of expertise and your know-how of the inner workings of the Office on the High Commissioner for Human Rights, this report has been termed as a damning report. What is really so damning about this report and what pushed the Sri Lankan government to the point of rejecting the content of this report outright? Um, well, I mean, uh, in order to be able to understand why, how the, we have to understand how the Office of the High Commissioner functions in the first place, or the UN functions. It's uh, based on whatever comes out of the United Nations is based on uh, the global balance of forces and the balance of power. Hmm. And the, the, uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights has become a political weapon. In fact, has, he has been, become an instrument hmm. of US foreign policy. And it has been termed even by UN experts as uh, uh, that, that there is a process of weaponization of human rights that has taken place. I believe it was the United, Nation, United States representative at the Human Rights Council under the Trump administration that termed the Human Rights Council as a cesspool of political bias. Yes, uh, uh, of course, it depends on, on, on he, he was referring to particular issues that were raised and that they are very seldom uh, issues that are uh, against the United States. Mm. Uh, uh, simply because the ba balance of forces has not permitted hmm. for any resolution, except the one single resolution that is the Cuban resolution sponsored by Cuba and which is adopted by all members of the United Nations, including the European Union, except by the United States and Israel. So it is possible to, to organize the forces in your support if you are fighting a common struggle and you are defending the, the principles on which the UN stands for. So it is possible, but, but it all depends on how, the, how, how you work on, on bringing countries together to, in your support. Now in this, now we're talking in this particular report, uh, obviously to me this uh, report uh, has very dangerous concepts in it. But this is not specially new. It's not damning. It's not something that we have just discovered. It has been the, the reports on Sri Lanka and also the resolutions against Sri Lanka have always been an attempt to precedent setting. That is, there has, is an attempt and has been an attempt by the United States, which is continuing, to change the, the very norms on which the current international order is based, which is the UN Charter, recognition and respect for the principles of sovereign equality of states, mm. uh, non-aggression, non-intervention, international cooperation, mutual benefit, mutual respect. Now, mm. all those are principles that are, go uh, uh, against efforts of the United States to uh, maintain its glo global hegemony, which is increasingly being challenged. So this report has in it several concepts that are not accepted mm. by the international, I mean, I mean international community, I mean the majority of the international community, that is the global south and the non-aligned movement. Mm. Those concepts are, and which comes again and again in this report, are the one that has to do with the third pillar of the responsibility to protect, the R2P, mm. which says that if a state is not 
willing, and, uh, willing or able to protect its own citizens, then we, the international community being, of course, the West, mm. we can intervene and we can protect your people. That is one. That concept is there and it's very clearly said by the, uh, the High Commissioner in our report. Secondly, there's a question of universal jurisdiction. Mm. By the way, the third pillar of R2P was rejected by the General Assembly very mm. recently. So, it's a very controversial concept. And they are in trying to impose it somehow on the United Nations member states. Second is the concept of universal jurisdiction. Mm. Universal jurisdiction, what does that mean? It means that any country has the right to try in their, on their territory any... In their courts. Right on, in their courts. Any, any thing that they consider to be a violation of international law, hmm. which took place in a totally different country, they can try in their courts. Impinging on those countries' sovereignty. Own national sovereignty and their national jurisdictions. So the, universal, the concept of ju universal jurisdiction has been rejected, especially by Africa because mm. of the way it's been implemented. So there is no agreement on that. Then there is a third conce concept there, which they are using, and which is the, qu the question of, uh, uh, which is very dangerous, which is the notion, which goes against the mandate of the Human Rights Council, given by the UN Charter, is the notion that you can somehow intervene to prevent violations of human rights. Mm. And, and so the concept of which is based on the Bush doctrine of preventive and preemptive war, that we have a right to intervene because we think you guys are going to kill, something is going to happen. But this report is all about trends, you know, about the past, you didn't do things in the past, and therefore now we think things are going really bad, and therefore we think the future is going to be terrible, and therefore the, the recommendations are very, very serious, which is also uh, precedent setting because what is the High Commissioner asking for? She's asking for the implementation of targeted sanctions. Mm. Now, and also the, on, on the universal jurisdiction. Mm. Now, these are, the universal jurisdiction, as I've already said, is a, 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 non, a, a concept that has not been accepted. That has been universal, rejected. Which has been United rejected, States. even. And then you have the concept of sanctions. Sanctions is, uh, you can only apply targeted sanctions, sanctions under Chapter 4 and Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. Mm. And that's only when there is a threat to international peace and security or there's an act of aggression against another country. Mm. And it is very clear, you cannot, the, the, the non-aligned movement has said it very clearly, its position is that it is not applicable as a preventive measure in any and all instances of violations of international law, norms or standards. So there are very clear, there are concepts within this document mm. that are extremely dangerous, not just for Sri Lanka, but for the rest of the world and for the multilateral system which is based on sovereign equality of states, where we are all equal, we all have one vote. Mm. There is no one country that is better than the other. So this is what they are going. To, this is what they want to change. And as I said, the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights is is an instrument of the United States. Now, while I'm saying that, I'm also saying that the international context is today is very fluid, very and volatile. Very volatile. The, the, anything can happen at any time. Hmm. So the balance of forces are not as they were a few years ago especially with the acceleration of the global systemic crisis mm. with COVID-19, mm. things have changed very radically and US hegemony is being increasingly challenged. And you even have the European Union, mm. which, is, which is moving to closer relationships with China ra rather than with the United States. Mm. And, that's, and you also have the other problem that the, the, the Western countries, which are most affected by the economic crisis and also by COVID-19, are having huge problems, even bigger problems that we have inside the country with, with increasing repression of political opposition and intimidation that is going on in the United States. We know what happened. It's open, the killing of, of, uh, of, of if you happen to be black, you, you, she doesn't raise that issue. So, so the, and in, the, in, in France that I know, it's a country that I know very well, there, there are threats. The, the, the president of the country said you cannot, it's, a, it's, it's offensive to, it's an offense to circulate a picture, a photograph which shows a policeman have beating up a, a, a black. So you see, there are things that are going on everywhere and there, there is an internal crisis, there are social reactions and the United States is on the verge of a civil war.
Mm. Trump did not lose completely. He's there. It's half, the country is divided in half. Mm. He still has the support of half the American population. So we are in a totally different situation. And I think uh, uh, it's, it's a situation full of opportunities that we can take advantage of. But it can also, if we don't take advantage of it, we can end on the wrong side of the barricade. So speaking on the content of this report, of course, that Sri Lanka has rejected, it speaks about uh, repeated measures that have been taken by the Sri Lankan government uh, to, uh, to enhance reconciliation here in Sri Lanka. And the report specifically points out to the repeated failures of these measures. Now, we know that in January, uh, President Gotabi Rajapaksa appointed another commission to review the recommendations of the previous commissions that were appointed for reconciliation and peace building in Sri Lanka. Was this done as a response to this damning report that was received by, of course, by Sri Lankan authorities back in November last year? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not in a position to tell you what is uh, in, the, in the minds of the, of the, of the people, decision makers uh, in government today. Uh, I'm uh, totally independent. I have no contact with any one of them. I'm an observer as much as you are. Uh, I, I, I think, again, coming back to what I said before, that this report refers to past violations and the fact that we have not acted to, mm. to, to resolve those issues. And it's not on the current situation, uh, violations that are taking place. Mm. Although I would agree that we have a problem with the 20th Amendment, we have a problem with anything that reinforces the power of one man versus popular sovereignty. I have made that statement when the 20th Amendment was being discussed. Mm. And so that's very clear. But this is our business. It's an internal matter, and we and, and Sri Lankan people, the people of Sri Lanka, have shown that they can change things. They mm -hmm. can prevent things from happening. We mm -hmm. prevented the, the, the signature of, uh, hopefully, the pre signature of MCC so far, and maybe hopefully giving away of the East Terminal to India. So we have, and we are, we are uh, fighting to prevent the sale of our public assets and pro lands and our resources to foreign companies mm -hmm. and to bring it under their control. We fought against bringing in foreign judges a hybrid court here. So we have, we, the Sri Lankans are quite capable of fighting their own battle. And, and so this, and, and the issue that she's raising is not a current issue, it's not in her mandate. So she, the agenda, she is, there is something else behind it. So I think that's what we have to try to understand instead of focusing on what, what, whether what we are doing now is right or wrong because we've had all, all those discussions. Hmm. We've had those discussions. So what, what, is, what is the government doing now? And that's what I'm concerned about. And I, I will tell you what I'm concerned about. Very clearly, Sri Lanka withdrew from the, the resolution, the previous resolutions that were signed by consensus. Hmm. The most important one, the first one, was 30-1, 2015, which was signed by the government, which made compromise on Sri Lanka sovereignty. And the, the foreign minister, when we withdrew, said the following things, and I want I'll come back to this again. He said that co-sponsoring remains a blot on the sovereignty and dignity of Sri Lanka, and I agree with him. Secondly, he says the, the commitments the Sri Lanka made had, had made the country, that is our country, a pawn on the chessboard of global politics. I agree with that. The third point he made was that it undermined the national interest and compromised national security. And then he refers to the problems we had with uh, the weakening of national intelligence operations and mm. safeguards during the Easter attack. Now, what we have heard now, and which the foreign secretary has announced, is that we are now Tr trying to seek a consensus with the core group on Sri Lanka. That is the country which all members of NATO, led by the United States, a military alliance which you have, in which you have Canada, Germany, you have um, uh, Montenegro and North Macedonia, both of them key allies of the United States in the Balkans. And then you have uh, the United Kingdom, of course, our former uh, colonial power. So, and they're all working, of course, un in, within, from, within the framework of a military alliance that is led by the United States. We know behind this is the United States, so we have to be clear about it mm -hmm. with this. So, th so you are, they are at the moment, uh, Foreign Secretary uh, Colombage announced that we are discussing with them. We are negotiating with them on a consensus. So, so trying what to come to a compromise. What does it mean? Yes, what does of course it means compromise, precisely. And it, it, it's no different from co-sponsoring, that for which 
Mangala Samaravira as foreign minister was accused of betrayal. Hmm. So what, we, what are we doing? We are going to discuss with this group of powers that are important forces, powerful forces, and hostile to Sri Lanka hmm. on a, a resolution that they would have drafted on the basis of the report of the High Commissioner, because that's how things work. Hmm. Most probably they were involved in drafting the report of the High Commissioner, and I can tell you that I have seen in the office the United States coming with a report on Sudan before a mission to Sudan took place, and said, here is your, to the, the rapporteur, here is a report, your report on Sudan. And I was there because I was in charge of the mandate, and I told the, the, the rapporteur, I said, but you haven't begun your mission. <laughs> He said, well, that's the report. So I know how it works. So it probably was written by outsiders. Mm. So here we are. We are negotiating on the basis of recommendations of a report that we have rejected. And the report is on the implementation of a resolution that we have rejected. Mm. So what this means is it's a whole, it's a cover up. So we are covering it all up by saying we are against it. But in fact, we are now working on a compromise. We are in fact renegotiating 30 slash 1 and the two other resolutions. So there is, there, is no, there is no real rejection of this report if the government is rejecting the report and then going ahead and discussing with the core group on a consensus, a compromise. Precisely. So you can't, any, any, any negotiation that takes place between a, a small country like Sri Lanka, which is indebted, dependent, uh, and, and we are looking desperately for money instead of finding it where the money is, there is money in the country. So we, and here we are negotiating with a big power on our own. Instead of going and looking for allies within the non-aligned movement mm. and within the global south to defend not just Sri Lanka's sovereignty, but to defend a multilateral order which is based on sovereign equality of all states. So you will, Sri Lanka, if it goes out and looks for support, uh, allies from our, from, from our own friends, friendly countries, then we can, we can, uh, we, have, we are putting forward, we are in a situation where we can, we can uh, 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 put some kind of pressure, important mm. pressure on those who are in the minority who are mm. trying to impose on Sri Lanka uh, a, a resolution, even compromise. There can be no, comp you cannot compromise on those principles. I don't see where, what we're going to compromise on. There can't be compromise on principles. Mm. So if the, if the, and, and what, by negotiating what Sri Lanka is also doing, it's also telling our friends, you stay out. We are talking. So don't stand we, against this. Don't stand against this. So they, even if it undermines their own interests, hmm. will not come out and ask for a vote on the resolution. Hmm. So uh, what we could have done instead is what we did in 2011, September. I was the permanent representative in Geneva at the time. Hmm. What did we do? We, I had a very clear instructions to the president, no negotiations, hmm. no negotiations. So what did we do? We went and and it was not, we didn't have to go even look for them. They were there. We had our non-aligned allies. Mm. We've always worked with them. Mm. We have the countries like Russia and China, which have never, and Cuba, which mm. have always been with us mm. and never betrayed the interests of Sri Lanka or the globe of the, or international community, mm. the independent countries that were former colonies and have become independent nations. They were there. We just had to go and talk to them and, and explain to them the importance of a resolution that's going to also have an impact on them. Hmm. So what happened was the Canada and the US were, had a draft resolution against Sri Lanka to put it on the agenda of the hmm. Human Rights Council for, the, for 2012. This is September 2011. Yeah. And what we did was in the, in the preliminary meetings, because there are negotiations taking place collectively on the draft. Hmm. We are not doing that. We are not negotiating with the all our uh, with the whole membership 
mm. and, and also observers, mm. which means also UN members. We are not doing that, but we did that in 2011, in September. We had, you can call it negotiations if you like. Mm. It is like that. You have discussions in meet, informal meetings, but public NGOs are there too. And then each country gives its position. And our friends who led the African group, Latin America, Asian powers, Russia, important countries made a mm. statement, we will not support the resolution. Right. What happened? Immediately afterwards, the Canadian ambassador called me and said, we have withdrawn the resolution because we know we're going to lose. Right. So it is simply that you just have to mobilize your friends. Mm. Now, obviously, Foreign Secretary Colombo Gay is not on that track. But I mean, if, if, it's, if, it's, if, we are, if we are going to a consensus resolution, then in fact we are compromising on an earlier resolution that we have rejected. And then what the foreign minister said about co-sponsoring of the earlier resolution remains valid. That is, it is a blot on the sovereignty and dignity of Sri Lanka. So this is that. going to be another blot on the sovereignty and dignity of Sri Lanka. It will be, we are back to square one. Right. So, uh, well, it's only a few more weeks until the human rights sessions begin. Uh, now, you said that uh, the secretary to the uh, foreign ministry is currently on a, on a wrong path. Are we too late to change paths and start looking for allies? Uh, well, again, that's up to uh, the, the, the government uh, to decide. I mean, and, and of course, it's for people, for, the, for public opinion to make their, their, their position known. Are we ready? Are we going on a path? We know, I, 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 I would like the people, I would like the people to know what happened on the, on, on the two occasions when mm. we did have a consensus resolution. One was in 1987. 1987, at the, at the time, it was the Commission on Human Rights uh, passed a resolution uh, which was, um, uh, which went through by consensus, which means Sri Lanka, it was the, it was the government, 1987, it was the government of President Jaya Jayawardena, and we decided, or the government decided, not to oppose it. Hmm. That's consensus, which is what we're trying to do now, hmm. which means we are not going to call for a vote on it. Hmm. We go ahead, we agree to it. What happened? That resolution was adopted on 12 March 1987. Harmless resolution relatively. It only said that Sri Lanka has to work to invite the International Committee of the Red Cross because mm. there was a humanitarian problem in the country. Right. That was all that it said. What did India do? Because India was behind that resolution, mm. as it probably is behind the ones now, because it's part of the Quad. Mm. So, uh, and a strategic partner of the United States. So, not even three months later, that's 5 June, from 12 March, 5 June, India violated Sri Lanka's sovereignty and territorial integrity by sending Air Force planes escorted by Mirage fighter jets to drop so-called humanitarian aid, which went to support the LTTE, the separatists. That was not even three months after the consensus resolution. And then, not even two months after that military intervention, because that's what it was, Sri Lanka was forced to sign this, the 1987 uh, Indo-Sri Lanka, Indo Lanka Accord, which continues to haunt us today with the 13th Amendment and devolution of power, which what it did was to divide our people on ethnic lines. Hmm. And, we, and this report of the High Commission, I want to say that she comes back and back and back about ethnic problems we are having. Hmm. We are not, I don't see us fighting each other. I don't, that I'm, I'm also from, I mean, Tamil myself, although I see myself first as a Sri Lankan. But I'm not fighting, I don't see any problems between this Tamils and Sinhalese people. Hmm. Or nor do I see problems with Muslim people. I have no issues, but she has issues with it. So this is what the United States and the United Nations did. In Iraq, they divided the people up there, the Shiites and the Sunnis. They hmm. did it in, in Yugoslavia. Two, of, two members of the core group are from the former Yugoslavia, North Macedonia and Montenegro. Right. So the, this is, what, this is the, the objective. So, so you have 1987. To, that was 1987. Then comes the 2000, uh, 2015 agreement. What happened after that? We had a, a series of reforms that took place. Hmm. You had, in which there was intervention 
when institutional and political reforms where foreigners were inside the offices of our government determining and drafting our laws and our policies, including in the office of the Prime Minister, hmm. Ranil Vikram Singh at the time. So, and, and then we had, of course, the Disappearances Act, which allowed us to extradite our own citizens to foreign countries to be tried. Hmm. And then we had, we signed AXA, which is the Acquisition and Services Agreement with the United States, which I must, which I must insist, continues to be in force and which allows U.S. military to use our strategic harbors and our ports hmm. and our own military installations and we have to provide them with spare parts and or with food and with oil and they can use it for their what they call interoperability to, to facilitate any wars of aggression against a friendly nation in our neighborhood. Right. And, and, and uh, we have to, in this context, I would like to again remind everybody of the new China policy of the United States, mm. which is not just that China is not just a competitor anymore. The problem with China is that it is, they want to uh, uh, ensure regime change in China mm. because of the Communist Party, the enemy is the Communist Party and the Marxist ideology. And the United Nations very clearly is very clear about sovereign equality and non-interference in the affairs, internal affairs of countries and the right of every state to determine their own political system, economic system, social system, etc. Mm. So here we are, Sri Lanka, in this strategic location. Mm. We, have, we have moved under resolution 20, okay, that's again this consensus, mm. uh, co-sponsorship, which is the same thing, mm. 20, uh, 30, 30 slash 1. We have withdrawn our military from uh, huge, num huge numbers from the north and east. Hmm. What does that mean? Two thirds of our uh, borders, hmm. territorial borders. We have brought in instead the Americans in there. We have allowed them to use our strategic borders and we're hmm. giving it also now maybe to India, which is the same thing because as I said, it's part of the quad, whether it's India, whether it's Japan, whether it's Australia or the United States, we're talking about the same monster. Mm. So here we are, have given, we brought our forces inside the country, the army, and that's the problem, I, am, I have a problem. Today, they're talking about militarization. Yes, there is a problem of militarization because I think the military is there to defend the territorial integrity of our country. Mm -hmm. And we have farmers to do farming, we have uh, doctors to do health and, and, and health workers for, to, to take care of the health of the people. But if we take away our armed forces from what they have been trained to do and what they're supposed to do, defend the territorial integrity mm. of the country, then we are exposing ourselves and we have exposed ourselves to through AXA especially. So Amara, we're in the final few minutes of this show. Judging by the way that the winds are flowing right now, what do you see happening at this year's human rights sessions? Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, I made this point uh, before we began. That is, uh, things are, are internet, globally, things are very fluid at the, at the moment. So any decisions that are taken, global de inter UN decisions, are always based on the balance of forces. Mm. And the balances of fo balance of forces are changing. The mm. US is becoming increasingly... Unpopular. Unpopular, alienated, imploding perhaps mm. from inside. So it's, uh, and then you have, you have on the other side, uh, the, 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 the concept of multilateral cooperation, multilateral system, mm. that is the, the other vision, the, the, the vision that is based on the UN Charter, mm. being defended, including by the European Union, so if you have, you have to choose between a unilateral vision of the world, which is which this, uh, which what the report is talking about and what we'll, we will uh, be supporting if a resolution is adopted by consensus, hmm. uh, then we will be taking the side of a unilateral uh, system, which is led by the United States and based on the logic of war, not hmm. the logic of peace. And there, on the other hand, you have this multilateral system. But right now, there is more and more support to defend the multilateral system. So if we go to the UN today, Council, and the Sri Lanka says, we are going to vote. Sri, well, Sri Lanka can't say because we are not members. Mm. But it's friends vote, and mm. Cuba has always been ready mm. to stand up and call for a vote. Mm. 
Right. But the vote will be not about you know whether we implemented LLRC or not, hmm. or if there's a trend or whatever. No, the vote is going to be, are you in favor of a, of a unilateral system which is led by the United States, which is based on vo the logic of war? Or are you in favor of a multilateral system based on the United, United Nations Charter, which is for peace, the prevention of war? Hmm. Not just peace, but preventing war. So these are two different, we are talking about completely different visions and if there is a change in the balance of forces. And if Sri Lanka, the government, hmm. and force, I'm, I, there are forces within the government. I'm not just saying the government as a whole, because hmm. I, I'm sure there are different forces within hmm. the government. But at the moment, the forces that represent compromise and concession hmm. and, 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 and um, capitulation hmm. is, I think, what the foreign secretary expresses when he says, we are going to talk. That's what we are going to. That will happen if those forces within Sri Lanka uh, are able to push their position through. But you have other forces, and that's what I see. What the foreign minister is saying, mm. but I don't hear the foreign minister speak very, very much. But what he says is, is, and I would like to say it again: co-sponsoring will be a blot on the sovereignty and dignity of Sri Lanka. It will make Sri Lanka a pawn on the chessboard of global politics, and it will undermine our national interest and our national security. So it, again, it depends on what happens inside Sri Lanka, how much pressure we are able to put on the government to go towards our allies and defend our sovereignty, and to defend a multilateral system on which our sovereignty depends. So I, I think it's, 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 all this has to happen if we are going to uh, make a change. If we are not going to do that, if we are not going to speak out, we will then we will end up... Back in square one. We will have... Next thing what we will have is... You will, anyway, you'll have, you have already MCC, the Millennium mm. Challenge Corporation agenda, mm. uh, to also to divide the country, take, take over our lands and our resources is happening, but under another, another name, Bim Savia. Mm. So already lands are being taken away from public, from the right. public. That's happening and that will, force will accelerate and maybe the Americans will come back again. Uh, they, I think we, we will sign SOFA. Mm. And SOFA is, in a way, worse than AXA. Mm. Although AXA is very bad, mm. extremely bad. But SOFA will allow boots on the ground. You will have Americans walking all over Sri Lanka mm. with their vehicles and with their weapons and intimidating and threatening the Sri Lankan people like they're doing in Japan and in South Korea. So here we will, we will be, that's what we, are head, we will head towards and we will head towards if there is a war. And, and my sense is that this, the United States is in such a difficult position right now and in terms of internally, internally it's in such a bad situation that it might want to distract attention by going to war somewhere. Mm -hmm. And don't forget the Democrats have been involved in, in more wars than Trump didn't get involved in any war any mm. war, but the Democrats have been involved. Mm. And so you, we might end up in a situation where uh, we are caught up in somebody else's war and our territory is used against our own neighborhood. Thank you very much, uh, Tamara Kunanayagam, a former uh, permanent representative of Sri Lanka to the United Nations for joining us on our show and clarifying these matters to the general public. And um, that's a wrap, of course, not only of this episode on the rule of law, but for this season of the rule of law. We will be taking a short break and we will be back with season two of the rule of law. Until then, take care and God bless.